Good to see you in the house of the Lord. What a great crowd on this cold Sunday morning. I'm glad that you did not allow the weather to keep you at home and in bed. And if you're watching from home, uh, we're still glad you came today and uh, chose to worship with us this morning. Take your Bibles. If you would, go to the book of 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. So if you're thinking this is the gospel of John, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, just keep going a little bit further. And it's towards the very end of the New Testament. 1 John, you'll have 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. 1 John, we're going to be here. Today we're beginning a brand new sermon series entitled Proclaim, Sharing Jesus Without Fear. And I think over the next few weeks, we're going to learn what it means to share our faith at home, at work, uh, in our own uh, family context, uh, in our city, uh, around the world, what that looks like. And maybe this is one of the areas that makes you the most nervous. And uh, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to demonstrate some of those things during the service. It's going to be interactive. It's going to be an opportunity uh, for you to just see firsthand how can I be effective as a a witness of Jesus Christ and what he's transformed in my life. I want to share a, a story. Um, years ago when I was in college, I worked at a church on the weekend. And uh, I was about an hour away from where, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, where I was in school. And I played the piano at this church on Sundays. I taught uh, the teen Sunday school classes on Sunday morning. And uh, I remember that Sunday. It was, it was a, uh, I had a, a great relationship with the pastor, but I didn't always know what he was preaching on. Didn't always know like what the what the theme of the of the week was or, or a particular passage he was preaching. And that Sunday, he decided he was going to do a uh, a mock uh, service where he was uh, sharing his faith or, or witnessing to someone in the church. And you know. Uh, you're thinking to yourself, he's going to be doing this thing on stage. He's rehearsed this thing, and he's practiced this with the person that he's dealing with, and it's probably one of the deacons or Sunday school teachers that he's, you know, he's known for years, and he's had this relationship with this, this guy. And So he brings this man up on stage. I think he looked out there and saw someone sitting on the second row, and Michael, you're my guy, and he brought him on up on stage, and they had a couple chairs, and he was like, hey, he started talking to him and talking about his, his life, and his, his testimony, and so he began to say, can I share the, the gospel with you? And I would like to open the word of God and show you how to be saved. And so he begins to share different verses from, you know, from Romans and from Ephesians and, and 1 John, different passages of scripture. And before long, he looked at this man and he said, would you like to pray and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And I will never forget this as long as I live. I was sitting on like the fifth row that Sunday this man, tears started pouring down his cheeks, and he said, Pastor, I would. And right there in front of God and everyone, and it was an attendance that Sunday, that man prayed and accepted Christ right there on the stage. And I'm sitting here going, what in the world just happened? I mean, how did you not know this guy was not even saved? And, he, and of all the people, I was like, obviously God's sovereignty is, is much greater than any of us. And he knew that and he had a plan for that. But I was sitting here going, how did he not know this guy was not saved? He's been sitting out there in the service week after week after week. But he accepted Christ as his Savior. But we're going to demonstrate some of those things for you over the next few weeks. And hopefully encourage you and help equip you to be more effective in having gospel conversations. And our desire is that you will proclaim the word of God with confidence, with boldness. Uh, this morning we're looking at the, the, the title is called Contagious Christian. And what does it mean to have a contagious faith? Sometimes you, in life there's been certain people maybe that had a, a certain walk with the Lord and it just oozed out of them. Their cup was overflowing and they had such a, a, a confidence in who they were in Christ. They had a, a confidence in their relationship with the Lord. Uh, and when you could not be around that person and not feel closer to God. And, and, and so having that confidence and the contagious spirit about us often allows us to make an impact far beyond anything we could possibly imagine. Oftentimes, due to lack of knowledge, experience, or a fear of the unknown, we remain silent when Christ has called us to go and be a witness. We are God's plan for sharing the gospel with a lost world, a world that's dark in sin. And if they don't hear, if, if, if we don't, how are they going to hear? In fact, the Bible says, how will they hear without a preacher? Did you realize this morning we are that preacher? 
You say, well, pastor, you know, I didn't get that call to be a pastor. No, all of us are called to be bold proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sharing what Jesus Christ has done in our lives is so vital, so important. So we want to equip the church this morning to be intentional in sharing our faith so that you're confident when you have a a conversation with someone at at work tomorrow. We want you to know how to be uh, effective in sharing what Jesus Christ has done in your life. And sometimes you say, Pastor, I don't know all the verses. I don't know how all. Well, we're going to help equip you with some of those things. We're going to help encourage you. And we want you to be confident so when those opportunities do arise, You say, Pastor, I don't even know if I would recognize that. We want you to recognize it. We want you to be thinking about it. We want you to be praying about it. We want you to, when the opportunity arises, you've been praying for this very moment. You recognize it and you jump on that and you allow the Holy Spirit of God to use you to challenge and share the good news of Jesus Christ. This morning, a lack of knowledge and experience will lead to a lack of confidence in sharing our faith. Church, we must do better. We must do better in sharing the good news. Why is it an age that we have more resources available to share our faith? We have more technology than at any other age. Sharing the gospel is at an all-time low. With over 80% of the unchurched knowing the world is out of control and hoping that there's a God who can make sense out of all of the chaos... There has never been a greater time to have confidence in sharing the good news. According to Lifeway Research, most Protestant churchgoers say they are eager. They are eager to talk to others about Jesus and they're praying for opportunities to share their faith. But most say that they've not had an evangelical conversation in the past six months. Uh, Scott McConnell of Lifeway Research said this, sharing the good news that Jesus paid for our sins through his death on the cross and rose again to bring us new life is the mission of the church. So that task of making disciples of all nations has not been fully embraced in the American church, especially by the majority culture. He said this in spite of the convenience of having Other ethnicities and immigrants from other countries often living in the same neighborhood. We are not effective in sharing that good news of Jesus. Less than half of churchgoers say that they've shared with someone in the past six months how to become a Christian. Of those who who have spoken to someone about becoming a Christian, most have done so with only one or two people. And one in ten churchgoers average at least one evangelistic conversation a month. So we're going to show a couple of things on the screen. Hopefully it'll be up there in the past six months. How many times did you share with someone how to become a Christian? And before we get pious, because church people like to be pious, but pastor, I do this all the time. I'm just, I just, everything about me just shares the gospel. Really? How many people have you brought to church in the last six months? How many people have you sat down with over lunch and talked to about how they can spend eternity in a place called heaven? How many people have you talked to about sin and and, and the punishment for sin? And How many people have you shared verses of scripture, how how they can enter into a personal relationship with Jesus? And and before we get too uh, far into this too, sometimes we might think, well, pastor, you know, I've been saved for 75 years. I mean, I've been saved for so long. I mean, I've got this in the, in the bag. And it's this younger generation that is not doing a good job at sharing with their own, their own people. That's not the, the, statistic, the statistics don't back that up. In fact, what happens is the more we're removed from society, as, as we retire, people that are, are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s have less opportunity because they're around less people. So they're saying... Actually, younger adults are the ones that are most effective today in sharing their faith because they're around people and they're having real conversations where people live and and the struggles they're facing. But church, this is staggering. 55%, 55% of this room has not shared the gospel with one person in the last six months. 
So if we want to say, let's take that to about right here. Everybody over here has not shared the gospel. And some of you are saying, I'm glad I sat on this side of the church today. <laughs> Don't get too excited. The reality is, is we are failing. A 45% grade is an F. Sometimes my kids will come home and they say, well, Dad, I made a 60. A 60? Uh, the, the scales are different than they were when we were growing up. I mean, 92 was a B when I was in school. Anybody else remember those days? I mean, these 10-point grading scales, I mean, y'all are getting off way too, I mean, way too easy. There was net in all 13, I was actually 14 years because I repeated the second grade. I got held back because of my age. And but anyway, we're not, I digress there. But all those years of going to school, never once did 92 bring me a, an A. I mean, I never had an open book test. Uh, you know, we didn't have Google. Uh, we passed school without Google. I mean, imagine that. I mean, you didn't, there was no asking Siri to do your homework for you. There was no uh, help questions on all the tests. And I mean, we were doing good if the Cliff Notes actually was available. You know, anybody remember Cliff Notes books? I mean, I bought those because I hated to read some of these books. And I'm like, I, I, I would give up the book to my younger sister. Will you read this and tell me what it's about? And I, I was like, I, I can't stand reading some of these books. And, and we, would, we would talk about them, and she would help me, was to help me learn how to do it. But I'd get the cliff notes, and I'd read it and hope I could pass the test. And the reality is, is we're failing at the thing that God has called us to do. And have, we're supposed to have the most uh, contagious spirit in sharing our faith. Only 20% of the, 24% of the church has shared the gospel with one or two people in the last six months. The next slide says... About how often, if at all, do you personally pray for opportunities to tell others about Jesus? 23% say daily. 21% says a few times a week. 12%. This right here is actually about equal with the number of people who share the gospel in the last six months. Are the ones that are actually praying about it. You see what happens is. If we're not fervent in praying. For opportunities. How equipped. And how prepared will we actually be. When God does offer those opportunities. When we're praying for God to enlarge our influence. And allow us to be able to make an impact. With the gospel. How often are we praying. You realize. 27% of the church. Say they rarely or never pray for God to open doors of opportunity. That's convicting. Because if we're not careful, we can get in our own little world. We can, we can have everything ordered. So Pastor David, we joined this church. And we, we believe you're preaching the word and we're, we're plugged in, we're serving, we're, we're giving, we're, 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 we're all in. We jumped in with both feet. And we're just trusting that, that the staff here at the church is, is doing all of that stuff. And, you know, those teachers that are teaching in Kid City this morning and in all of those nursery classes, I know they're sharing the good news. So. I feel pretty good about what we're doing here. And we have missionaries in countries all over the world. And, and I know Pastor Omar this morning, he's faithful. Uh, Pastor Elijah, he's faithful. God, the pastors in India, they're faithful. God is using these people. Absolutely. But what are we doing? What are you and I doing? What am I, making an I statement, what am I doing to witness and share the good news of Jesus with the people God's placed in my life? There's so much work to be done that the church, if we're going to ever live up to the potential of our mission and our calling. Our mission today is together we lead and create disciples of Jesus. How are we going to share our faith in a lost world? The word of God tells us this morning we must be confident of being confident in our salvation. In 1 John chapter 5 there's a, a, a call, a command to be confident in, in who we are in our faith. And before we can ever be a contagious Christian, we must have confidence 
in what Jesus Christ has done in our life. We must know without a doubt we are truly a child of God. So, so many people go through periods of doubt on their salvation that it's normal. I struggled with this for years. I made a decision to trust Christ as my Savior at the age of five. And she said, Pastor, I don't even believe that's possible. I'm living proof. Five years old. You say, what happened? My parents drug me to church for nine months before I was born. I was hearing those songs of the faith. I was hearing the preaching of the word. Uh, they made sure that I was under the sound of the gospel every day of my life. And it pierced through the darkness. And I saw that Jesus Christ died on the cross and was buried and rose again. And did I know all of the, 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 the tenets of scripture and all the doctrines of scripture? No, but I knew enough to know I was a sinner and desperately in need of a savior. And I prayed and asked Jesus to forgive me of my sin and to, to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. At the age of five and at seven years old, I was, I was baptized. And that's one reason I'm very uh, I'm confident when kids come to faith in Christ, you can understand, you can know that you're saved. I don't push them, though, because I think there needs to be an understanding. And, and sometimes when some, a kid gets saved at five years old or six years old, or most of my kids got saved by the age of seven. And, but the, rea the, the reality is, is I don't push them. I want them to keep asking questions. As a parent, when your kids come, don't push them to make a decision, but encourage them in their relationship. And as they're asking, as they're inquiring, Keep answering their questions. Keep pointing them back towards scripture. Keep encouraging them. And as they're hearing the word of God taught week after week, it will take root in their life. And folks, they will hear the gospel and, and hopefully at an early age begin. So, But sometimes, I mean, I don't know anybody else gets saved at five years old. Anybody else in the building got saved at that age? Sometimes, if you go back, I don't remember much before five years old. In fact, I go back and it's hard to remember those details. And so... I did go through periods of doubt as a teenager. Did I truly understand it? Did I, did I mean that decision at, at five years old? And, and folks, what I understood later in life is the, the part that was missing was the relationship, the growing in my faith, the, the allowing the Holy Spirit of God to convict me of sin and, and that daily walk with Christ. Folks, we, we read the word daily and my dad was a pastor of anybody had the opportunity to hear the gospel, I did. But the reality is, is yeah, I had to be growing daily in my walk with Christ. I want you to be confident this morning. The word of God says we can know that we're saved. In 1 John 5, 11, it says, this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in who? His son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may what, church? No. You may know that you have what? Eternal life. Eternal life. See, why is this so important? Because so many people, if you ask them on the street, do you know for sure you're going? I hope so. I think so. I I'm pretty sure my... Good works outweigh my bad works. I'm a, I, I'm a good person. I, I have good intentions. And if we could be saved off our good intentions, church, uh, there's a lot of good people out there. But the reality is, is good intentions send you straight to hell. Until you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that's the only thing that transforms our life. Having a confident relationship with Jesus allows us to be contagious if you know what Christ has done and how he died, he was buried, he rose again to pay for our sins. It helps us to have confidence in our own relationship with the Lord. John tells us this, that he says, you may know that we have eternal life. We don't have to live in doubt. We don't have to live experiencing the fears. It's difficult to share our faith with others when we're not confident of all that God has done in our lives. And the, the love he's shown to us will operate with a completely different spirit when we know for sure, when we're confident of who we are in Christ. The word of God says we've been redeemed. Live like it. Psalm 107 verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed 
from trouble, or another version says, from the hand of the enemy. What happens is when we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ, he's redeemed us, he's snatched us, he's delivered us from the hands of the enemy. He's placed us on the rock of Christ Jesus and given us a confidence that we have. God has redeemed us, so share the good news. And the gospel is only good news if it arrives in time. Secondly, we can be a witness for Christ by being empowered in our walk. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. What's he saying? He says there is something that happens at the moment of salvation. There's something that begins to take place in your life when you place your faith in Jesus. At the moment of salvation, the word of God says the Holy Spirit takes residency in our hearts and lives. It's at that moment he begins to empower us to live the life that God has called us to. He encourages us through his spirit, through his word, through prayer, through spending time with God's people, fellowshipping with the church. He convicts us of sin. He gives us the power to be the witness that he's called to be. He says, you will receive power. Aren't you thankful it's not up to us to try to live the Christian life on our own? We can't. We can't. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. He empowers you to walk in the Spirit, to yield to His control. He empowers us to walk the Christian life or, as we said last Sunday, run the race that God has called us to run and with confidence. He talked, we talked about that last week with His power. In James chapter 4, verse 7, he says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In other words, he gives us the power, but we have to act upon it. We have to choose to to walk in the Spirit. He says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. In other words, as we're going through life, we're choosing the presence of God, choosing to to, to live in in, in confidence and have that contagious spirit about us. So just when you think you can't, that's when the Holy Spirit of God empowers us as we draw near to God. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul writes, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. Church, he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he'll also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. What's he saying is, as the devil is tempting you this week, as he's putting things in front of your face or putting blinders on to not see the the work of the Holy Spirit, as he's trying to deceive you and is trying to discourage you, he says, God will not allow you to be tempted above that you are able with the Holy Spirit's power to say no to the devil, to no to the temptation, no to the struggles of sin. He says that you may be able to endure it. So when temptations come your way this week, and they will, he empowers us to say no to the devil and yes to the savior that same holy spirit gives you the power this morning to be bold in your witness for jesus christ we must lean into that relationship with the lord and draw the power from the holy spirit that he gives apart from that you cannot be a witness that god has called us to be thirdly he says we must be courageous in our witness he says you will receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you the second part of verse 8 says You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What's he saying? He says, if you and I are going to be effective at the mission God has called us to be, he says, we must be courageous in our witness. We must be courageous. The the, the job is too great to do accomplish on our own. So that command's not just given to pastors and missionaries and evangelists and here in October, we heard Pastor Elijah from uh, Romania come and, and he preached on missions and, and shared really his heart for how God has allowed them to start churches all across Europe. And, and folks, it's easy to look at that and say, man, we're doing this. We're accomplishing something. 
Pastor Omar comes from Remain from uh, Nicaragua and preaches, and we're like, man, we're, Pastor, we're doing it. We're reaching. We, we hear from uh, Pastor Allison came from India and, and and sang and played the guitar and and preached, and it's easy to say we're doing it, Pastor. Fifty-five percent of us have not shared our faith with one person in the last six months. The Great Commission is given to every believer. And he's called us to be courageous. Christ called us to go and be a witness. It's not a suggestion. It is God's plan for reaching the world that's in complete darkness. So when we complain about what's happening around the world this morning, do you realize it's easy to complain? The reality is the hard work is to get busy at the job God has already commissioned us to do. The call he's already given us to go and make disciples of all nations. It begins at home. Jesus is the answer for the world's problems today. If we truly believe that, we must respond by sharing the gospel in our own family, in our own home, in our own city, our own neighborhood, our own state. Our own nation, God knows our country needs a touch from heaven this morning. And you say, Pastor, I'm so worried about what's coming, what the future holds, what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening in Washington, what's happening in downtown Raleigh. Folks, the reality is Jesus is the only answer for the world's problems. It's not who gets elected president or, or governor or senator or God tells us to pray for all those people. They're placed in positions, and God raises up rulers and brings down rulers. He says to pray for them that we might live godly and quiet and peaceable lives. But folks, if you're hanging everything on on November 3rd or 4th or whatever the election day is this year, can I just say you're, you've, hinged, you've hitched your wagon to the wrong horse. Because the reality is, is it's not based on the Republicans or the Democrats or the independents. It's based on getting our hearts right with God and trusting in his plan for the future of our nation. And folks, he still called us to be a witness. The church in Korea, the church in China is thriving. Churches in countries where the gospel is not freely preached on the street corners it's the gospel thrives in those environments. The persecution of the church breeds the gospel in ways that we can't even imagine. And so, folks, I believe we've got to be faithful. The word needs a move of the mighty hand of God this morning. The good news is God has an army. We're right here. Do you hear that? God has an army. A big army. Because this church is so much bigger than this room that's nearly filled to capacity. Church, God has an army all around the world of faithful men and women who've got to get active and can't sit back and wait for, well, I'm going to wait for my pastor to do it. He'll lead that next trip, and maybe one of these days I'll go to India, or maybe one of these days I'll go to Romania or, or to Brazil. No, God has called us to be a witness in Raleigh. And if we're not a witness in Raleigh, we'll never do it in Brazil, India, or Kenya. Folks, God's called us to be a faithful witness. The sad reality is, is we believe the Holy Spirit has the power to change lives, and yet over half of the church hasn't shared the gospel with anyone in the last six months. That's where we are. We must rally the troops. We must remember the call to make disciples. And then he ends this here. He says, by being engaged in our worship. Look at verses 9 of Acts chapter 1. He says, when he had said these things, as they were looking on, this is Jesus. He was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Imagine this morning being present as Jesus says his final goodbye. As he's getting ready to go up into heaven, ascend into heaven. He says, while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, 
two men stood by them in white robes and, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. What's he saying? He says, what are you doing? <laughs> They're just standing there, staring into the heavens. I mean, I, I can think of Gomer Pyle standing there going, golly. I mean, uh, what just happened? Uh, what did we just, exp- what did we just witness? Jesus just ascended into heaven and the angels are standing there going, what are you waiting on? He's called you. He's commissioned you. He's given you a mission to, to accomplish as a church. And he says, why are you just standing there gazing into heaven? What are you looking at? Get busy. Engage. Christ has already left the building. It was time for them to gauge, engage in worship. And folks, you can't sit back and allow Christ to do everything. His work was accomplished. It's time for the church to engage in being contagious in our witness, sharing the gospel ourselves. Get busy. There's an entire world that needs to know of the life-changing power of the gospel. I want to, this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, I want to introduce you to someone. It doesn't matter what you've done. He loves you. He's for you. He, he died for you. And he loves you so much that he will save you and he will forgive you of your sin. And he offers you a right relationship with God the Father. He's a friend that sticks closer to a brother than a, than a brother. He'll meet you in your hour of need this morning. And he, he doesn't hold a grudge. You say, Pastor, you don't understand. I've been hurt by the church. I'm sorry for your your pain. I'm sorry for the experience you've had, but the reality is this morning is God is greater than that, and he loves you, and if you'll come to him, he will forgive you, and he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He'll pick you up, he'll set your feet on the rock of Christ, and he'll give you hope and a future. He loves you this morning. If you already know Christ as your Lord and Savior, let your light shine for Christ this morning. Matthew, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. It's time we engage in our worship. Start letting the world see the hope that's within our hearts. Share the good news of Jesus coming again and how he came to save the lost. And it doesn't matter what we've done. Jesus Christ has the power to save. He's coming back. Again, he's coming a second time. My prayer this morning is that you know him. My prayer is that if you don't have a personal relationship before you leave today, you allow someone to have the privilege in showing you how you can have a personal relationship with Jesus. And say, Pastor, what's the application? Don't ever get over what Christ did for you when he saved you. It's time to get back to that first love. You see, what happens is oftentimes we get on fire for God at the moment of salvation. And boy, we can't wait to share our faith. We can't wait to tell someone what God has done for us. Six months in, we get into the routine of, well, we just go to church on Sunday. We just kind of do our thing. And before long, we can find ourselves going through the motions don't, our, don't allow yourself to get over what Jesus Christ has done. He saved us. It's time to get back to that intimate, that close relationship, that first love of, of experiencing what Jesus Christ did in transforming our life. It's, start, it's time to start sharing the good news of the gospel with our friends, our relatives, our associates, our neighbors. It's, the, the acrostic is Fran, but start sharing the gospel with our sphere of influence. The people that you work with, there will not be another person who's better at sharing Jesus with them than you. Won't be, another, won't be a better person. Remember in, Stephen, I'm going to tell you, 
We were in Romania in June of 2016. Back in November of uh, 2015, uh, I asked him one day in, in life group, I said, Stephen, why don't you go with me to Romania? I'm going in January. He said, I'm going over to preach. I want someone to go with me. I said, oh, all right, I'll go. Said, Wait, what? <laughs> You're going to go? I, I, I didn't think you were going to say yes. He said, I'll go. I was just in a couple months. I, I'll go. You don't need to check with the wife? She's okay with it. We're good. Thanks, Shelly, for being understanding. And so he went with me in January, and I preached, and he shared his testimony. One of the churches, Maranatha, in Beush, Romania, he shared his story of how God transformed his life, and he thought he was going to die, and he went through a just a painful period of, of life ex, uh, circumstances and God radically transformed his life and I'll never forget the, the fire chief for that city was sitting up in the balcony and he got saved during that service it wasn't from uh, the preaching of what I did it was from his testimony of what God did and a few months later, I was planning another trip to go back in, in, uh, in June, and this was a medical team that we were taking to Romania. And Stephen said, I don't have any medical experience, but I'll go. And he went, and I remember him helping share the gospel and leading someone to faith in Christ who came to a medical clinic. Never forget... Stephen looked at me with tears in his eyes. He said, why did I have to go all the way to Romania to lead someone to Christ for the first time? I looked at him and said, I don't know the answer to that, but I guarantee you won't be the last person you lead to Christ. He went back home and started having a Bible study at his work with his co-workers Brought in a, a, a chaplain to even help encourage some of them in their, in their relationship with the Lord. And it's like, you're going to have the best opportunity to reach your co-workers with the gospel because of your proximity. Because of the relationship that God has given you. Your family members, and I've said this many times, sometimes our own family, those under our own house are the most difficult to reach. Maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a, 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 a child or a grandchild, but they might be the hardest people. But folks, you have the best opportunity to see them come to faith in Jesus because of your relationship. Your neighbors, you're the greatest influence on them. Our city is going to be won by people in churches just like this who get a burden and you're sitting here this morning saying pastor Evan, i don't even know what i would say that's okay can i say this i remember witnessing on the streets of washington dc with a team of teenagers and encountering two different people that i shared the gospel with that were muslim and in all of my training with these teenagers, I'm going to be straight up honest with you. My greatest fear was I'm going to encounter someone that I don't know what to say. I'm going to encounter someone who's going to have a belief system that's very foreign to me. And I'm going to be like, I don't even know what they believe. I remember studying false religions and, and, and cults in college. And all of a sudden I found myself witnessing and sharing the good news of the gospel with a, a man who was Muslim. And do you realize in that moment, the thing I had been most afraid of, God gave me exactly the words to say. He brought things, verses of, 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 of scripture to mind 
different tenets of their faith that he brought to mind, and I was able to recall them. And some of the things I was like, I didn't even know. I didn't. I couldn't have remembered that. If you'd asked me if you want to be a millionaire, play one of these games, and you got to answer the question, I would. I would have missed it. I, I'd have had to call a friend or something or look it up. But the reality is just. I had no idea where it even came from, but the Holy Spirit of God gave it to me at just the very moment that I needed to share the good news of Jesus. You see, that's what happens is when we step out in faith under the power and the direction of the Holy Spirit of God, you don't have to have every single answer. God gives it to you through His Holy Spirit, through His Word, through prayer, through praying. God, give me the opportunity. God, open the door to share with that coworker that seems so lost, that seems so far from God. God knows that. He desires to save them. That family member that you're like, I don't see any way possible, but God. But God. He has a way of doing the supernatural just when we least expect it folks that's when he does his greatest work over the next few weeks we're going to explore various methods of sharing our faith and some of you say well there's only one way to do that really i've not seen that in scripture in fact there's multiple methods some people say well pastor what's the best Bible version to read. The one you'll read. Well, I don't agree with that. If you don't read it, it does you zero good. The best method is the one you'll use. The one you'll employ to use in sharing your faith. And folks, it might be your testimony. Your personal testimony may be the greatest opportunity to impact your neighbors, your co-workers, your friends, our city. Share it. Share what Jesus has done in transforming your life. Maybe it's your testimony is painful, but you know what? It's your story. It's uniquely yours. I was talking to someone this morning. Their 82-year-old father accepted Jesus as his savior right here in this church on Christmas Eve night. You know what I told him? I said, you know what that does? It, it reminds me we're never too old. It's never too late. As long as we have breath in our body, we ought to be sharing the good news of what Jesus Christ can do. Pray now for open doors of opportunity to have gospel conversations with those that need to receive Jesus Christ. Easter, let me give you the 411, the quick version, it's 10 weeks away. I mean, you can go ahead and take those Christmas lights down. I mean, Easter Bunny's coming in 10 weeks. I'm, ten, I'm playing. But the reality is, is some of us are like, it's like, oh, we're, we've got a, a, a lifetime. No. It might be 20 degrees outside today, but I'm telling you, Jesus rose from the grave on Easter Sunday. That's coming up the very end of March. Christmas and Easter are two opportunities, the greatest opportunities all year to get people under the sound of the gospel and, and allow them to hear that Jesus loves them. On Christmas Eve, eight people in this service, pray to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Let's give the Lord a hand in. But you know what? That's just the beginning. I believe on, on Easter, 25, 30, could come to faith in Jesus Christ. If we're praying, if we're intentional, if we're contagious, if we're inviting, when those cards come out in a few weeks, and you're going you're to hear me say about it because I'm going to have them out. And I'm going to say, share this car. Put it in the hands of a, of a co-worker, a neighbor, a friend, a, a family member. Invite them to Easter service. What will happen is you'll be so intentional. You'll be so excited. You'll be nervous. Yeah, you will. But you know what? It might be the greatest conversation you have all year. And you can, we can change that statistic. 
Instead of 55% have never shared it in the last six months, what if it said 85% of the church here at Calvary Raleigh has shared the gospel at least once in the last six months? You want to say we're not going to have 25 people saved on Easter Sunday? I would say let's double or triple that. The reality is, is as we get excited, as we become confident in our faith in Jesus, as we learn various methods to share the good news of the gospel, we become contagious Christians. We become so overflowing with what God is doing. We can't wait to share what Jesus Christ can do. It was cold this morning. I was thankful that We've kept the garage cleaned out so we could park in there <laughs> because it was at 21 degrees in my car when I got in this morning. But when it's cold outside, sometimes it's hard to start the car. It's sluggish. I'm afraid what's happened over the years, some of us have kind of grown a little cold in our walk with God. And just like sometimes we have to put those charge your cables on there and re-jump start. We don't have to get saved again, but we've got to be reminded again of what Jesus Christ has done in our life so we might get on fire again and become a contagious Christian so that Christ can use us. We've lost that contagious spirit. We've, we've forgotten what God has done for us. It's time to get a jump start this morning we need God to reawaken his spirit and work in our hearts and lives. Give us boldness to worship him passionately and to share the good news without fear. Over the next few weeks, as we learn how to proclaim the gospel message, pray that God would embolden our walk, our worship, and our witness as we seek to fulfill his mission. Heavenly Father, would you move in our hearts this morning? Long before we can implore methods of witnessing and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, we must be confident in our salvation. Maybe you're here this morning, you say, Pastor David, the message has been crystal clear. I cannot honestly say without a doubt that I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That's okay. You've come to the right place. Because I want to tell you this morning, the safest place for you to be this morning is in a church that believes in the life-changing power of the gospel. And you're amongst hundreds of other people who have said yes to Jesus, who have said yes to the gospel, have yes to what Jesus accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in a few moments, our band is going to be singing one final song. I'm going to be right down here on, on your right, my left. Pastor Jackson is going to be down here on the opposite side on your left. We would love the privilege and opportunity of taking the Word of God and showing you how you can have a personal relationship with Jesus. Don't leave today without being confident of who you are in Jesus of how he's saved us and how he desires to transform our lives. Maybe this morning you've, you've been saved. You say, Pastor David, I need that jump start. I have gotten cold over time. It doesn't mean our, our, our faith has, has failed us. It's, maybe it's just we've become too comfortable. We've become we, we've settled into church life and we're, we're doing those things that we ought to do, but 
We've lost that fire. We've lost that contagious spirit. We've lost that desire to share what Jesus Christ has done in our hearts and lives. Can I just say, no one ever closed the altar. Yeah, we went through COVID and there was a period of time where some of us had masks on and we sat six feet apart and all those things. But the reality is, is sometimes there's something freeing about going to an altar and just pouring out your heart before the Lord and saying, God, I need you. I want that fire again. God, would you restore that, that first love? Uh, that Would you just restore that relationship that I, I once had where I couldn't wait to share what Jesus Christ was doing in my life? Maybe it's a, a particular person God's laying on your heart. Is that, Pastor, I know who that first person I'm going to give that card to and invite. I knew that first person that when I'm more comfortable, I'm going to share the good news of the gospel with. I already know because God's laid that person's name on my heart. Why not come and pray specifically this morning for courage? Pray that God would give you the, the ability to step out in faith and under the power of the Holy Spirit, be a bold proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus.